All right, I have four o'clock, and so in the interests of time and that this is a short session, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, as, as by way of an announcement, unfortunately, Nancy Ritchie, who is the co-chair for this effort, is not here. Uh, she apparently had a um, head-induced fall and is recovering from that, but unfortunately had to miss this particular event. So thoughts are with her. Um, and hope she, she recovers quickly. So um, the Google Doc has a lot of stuff in it. I've got the QR code here. You can navigate to that through um, the Kiko chat links, um, and I encourage you to do so. Please do add your name um, and information as you feel led to the session. Um, and let me move forward with what we're talking about here. So, um, Title of this session, what comes after community participation guidelines for equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice. Um, our objectives for this session is to make progress on defining the goals and next steps for ESIP as it relates to these things. And, and I'd like to encourage us to think about these from a couple of different perspectives. What can an ESIP, um, what can and should ESIP do? In, in terms of changing ESIP, what are we doing that's sort of inwardly facing? And, and some of that is, is around the question of who's in the room, who's not in the room. Um, how do we help continue to do the things to make people feel welcome and that they are a part of the ESIP community? But there's also an aspect of this, um, what can and should ESIP do to change the world? Um, as it relates to equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice. So let's talk a little bit about what ESIP has done. Um, there's a poster presentation that we've presented at a couple of different venues. Um, it was available at the January ESIP meeting. Um, there's a link to it um, that's in that Google Doc, um, but it is presenting this as a part of a pathway uh, that we, we see ourselves as being part of a journey um, and what are our next steps uh, on that journey. So it, we, we made some recommendations to the to the ESIP board um, and I've summarized them here and that's that's talking about looking at where we are and where we're headed. Um, so we as ESIP uh, need to develop and publicize some concrete goals related to these. It's a little bit of a challenge or a lot of a challenge because there's a number of things that we can say as goals and things that we can count, but do those actually make a difference? And are we counting and measuring the right things? Um, so that's part of the challenge in front of us and part of what I'm after here um, in this session is both getting some input and opening up the, the communication for um, getting input and things that occur to folks after this meeting um, and moving forward. Um, we've recommended a baseline assessment for the ESIP community, um, and we'll talk about that um, in a few minutes, um, and, and refreshing that assessment. Again, there are many aspects of diversity uh, and asking some questions of ourselves, which are the ones that we want to measure and pay attention to. Um, ensure that the plans, actions, activities are openly shared and widely available. And as an example of this, part of what we've talked about is ESIP does an annual report. Well, let's take a look and as part of that ESIP annual report to ask that question, what have we done? Um, and then as we're reflecting on the strategic plans, what are we going to do? Um, this advisory committee is a transient one. Uh, we were initially authorized for a year. We've been extended through the end of the calendar year for us to be able to make some recommendations um, around the more permanent structures to look at this. And again, part of the, the goal with this strikes me as, as the right thing. We're not trying to say that e equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice is a bolt-on, that it is just the responsibility of this particular committee or this particular structure. Um, but that this is a group of people for whom they're paying focused attention and trying to work with the other parts of ESIP to ensure that these things are woven throughout the things that we do. 
There are some interesting questions and I would love to hear ideas. Uh, Susan would love to hear ideas about um, pursuing funding opportunities. So there's some limits to what ESIP can do within its current budget. There are some things that ESIP is uniquely positioned to be able to do. There are some things that are outside of our wheelhouse and being able to discern what are the things that we should do within the existing budget? Where should we seek additional funding? Where should we partner with other organizations? Um, and where should we recognize that, yep, that's a useful and important thing to do, but that's not something that we can do well. Um, or it's not far enough up the list, there are other things that we would do better that we should focus on. Um, and then ensure that the community participation guidelines and other policies are updated to explicitly include some other aspects uh, of things that, that are not explicitly there right, na right now, but particularly accommodation um, and accessibility. Again, things that we have done, things that we are trying to, to do, but being a bit more explicit about those. So we took a look at the strategic themes, um, and there, there are two that really do tie very strongly into this. Again, the work on equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice is not new for ESIP. Um, there are aspects about this that have been, from my perspective, although admittedly, I have a very privileged perspective uh, that have been part of ESIP since we started. We, we do some good things, and we need to do more and better things is uh, the way we have been looking at this. So promoting that healthy and inclusive culture, that has been part of our strategic themes from a couple of years ago. Um, and making earth science data matter um, ties in particularly to the justice um, aspect of this. But again, we, these strategic themes, the strategic plan is something that came out two and a half-ish years ago. It's time to take a review of this and say, okay, what do we want to change? What do we want to keep? Um, as we look at these strategic themes, looking forward for the next five, 10 years. And I've been thrilled to be a part of some of the board's discussion on those questions. Um, and again, there's some links to this in the Google document. Was thrilled to see some things earlier this week. So I got to see some of this on Monday. This is part of what Ken presented in the plenary. Our new ESIP vision, a world where data-driven solutions are a reality for all by making earth science data actionable by all who need them anytime, anywhere. That at least speaks to me of an intent that is strongly aligned with equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice. And our ESIP mission, empower innovative use and stewardship of earth science data to solve our planet's greatest challenges. Again, um, something that, that to me resonates with that and gets at a point that I think many of us are after. How do we weave these values into all of the things that we do? Um, and then the core values, integrity, inclusiveness, collaboration, openness, curiosity. Again, supportive. So, let me talk about one piece of this, which is starting to get at the question of who's in the room. Um, that doesn't tell us necessarily about who feels welcome in the room. That's a very important question, but at least understanding who's not in the room is an important question. And there's some things that we can do with that. There's some, some work that had to get done. And again, staff and some of the cluster um, people have been very involved with this. We recognized the need to do this a while back. We just didn't have the vehicles by which we could do this. Um, we didn't have an infrastructure we could, where we could appropriately protect this information. We now do. We did not have a privacy policy as an appropriate framework under which we could collect and manage this information. We now do. So we have laid some of the band or some of the foundational blocks and by we i'm not included with that i'm happy to, you know to recognize the contribution, this is we is in all of ESIP and particularly things that the staff have done and spearheaded. Um, so there's a lot of aspects of diversity, we could think about this. Um, but the, the suggestion came out well, 
The American Geophysical Union has spent a lot of time, energy, and effort on this question. Why don't we start with the questions that they're asking from a baseline diversity? That gives us some opportunities to do interoperability with what AGU is doing, some intercomparison. There are lots of very good answers to these questions. And so our perspective is, that's a good answer. Let's start and make forward some forward progress. So let me ask Susan if you want to add anything to what I've said. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your voice on the on the issue and 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 yeah we've been working together and I think you have a good um, a good pulse on what we've been doing and what we've been prioritizing and and that there you know sometimes it's hard to move slowly and deliberately when you want to move fast and having to look at at some of these things like we didn't have a data privacy policy I don't want to collect sensitive information until we we do those so we're trying to put the pieces in place to do the work well and thoroughly all right so that will happen fairly soon there's some further conversations that need to happen with agu on this point um and it's a unique opportunity, as, as Susan has pointed out in a couple of different venues. We've not asked for this information before. We're going to be reaching out to the membership and saying, hey, we've not got some ability for you to please update your profile. And so let me strongly encourage you that when you get that, to please do so. Please encourage your friends and colleagues to do so. Um, that will help us to get some important information. So. This is where I want to spend most of the effort um, in this section. So there is a Slido, which is a code ESIP, uh, excuse me, EDIJ, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Justice. So there's the first question here. And again, th this is a, a pattern that I like using. We're asking some questions, what needs to change? But the first question that I want to ask is, what do we need to not break? Um, so to advance equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice for ESIP, what should ESIP keep doing? So let me give you a few minutes to reflect on that. Um, and then I'll get some help here to figure out how to bring those answers up. Yes, go ahead and bring those answers up. Oh, I think they're here. And then you can just switch back to the presentation here. Thank you. I can help. Thank you. One more question that I like that helps it be more visible. This one. Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> That's weird. I, try, I was trying present mode, because then it makes it bigger on the screen to read. Or you could just do that. <laughs> OK. So some votes about having community fellows. We have two here in the room with us. Um, So one of the things that the committee recommended, and I saw up here, and I'm just curious if there are suggestions in the room. Not, 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 not sure if I can just freeform this on your verse. This is a um, conversation. The, the statement scholarships for attendees. So for the past three years, we have had a scholarship program for people from, I'm gonna try and, how did we describe it? What was it called? A scholarship specifically to attract diverse participants to our meetings. And we specifically 
said, we are looking for people who identify as Black, Latino, or from Indigenous communities. And we put the scholarships out there to help make the meetings more affordable to attend. The first time we did it, it was still a virtual meeting. And so it covered the registration fees. And I worked really hard to get it out there. I went to, I looked, I tried to pull up lists of HBCUs and tribal colleges and universities. Then I went in and I looked at their curriculum. I look at what classes are being taught that might have people, students that would, would resonate with ESIP. And then I found the professors and then I sent them emails and nobody replied, nobody. The only people we got were when the federal agencies shared the opportunity with their internal um, affinity groups is not the right word, the word I'm looking for, but their internal DEI groups. groups. And I was, and, and that was wonderful, but I was like, those, those individuals are already plugged into the federal agencies, right? Like they're, they're being served and reached. Since that first time where I was able to put a lot of time and effort into it, we have not had a single person apply for the scholarships for the meetings. And so like, I see that up there and I'm like, yes, let's do it. But I'm like, I've done it. <laughs> and I mean, with a staff of five, there's only so much outreach we can do. Clearly, we're not doing it right. So if that is your suggestion, maybe go into the replies or the comments. I'd like to know, like, how do I get it out there to the right people that we're trying to reach? Because we're not we're, we're trying and we're not getting it. <laughs> So I think one thing is the partnership with others. So I think you're trying to do it from, by yourself and which can be hard. And then there are other groups like the uh, environmental justice groups you have contacted through the Unbound, that might be a great place. And then the other is a tribe, there's a association or consortium for those tribal uh, colleges who have those data science programs and those can be an excellent groups to get those information out there. And also, I think the informatics groups will be another, within AGU and EGU, those, uh, they will have probably other connections as well. Susan, I was just going to ask you to elaborate a little more on kind of how you have um, portrayed ESIP or explained ESIP when you have sought that type of participation. That's a great question. Um, I'm, I don't know that I portrayed it any differently than I do to everyone, um, but I explained it as a community of earth science data professionals who gather to collaborate and work together to advance, you know, to work on common challenges and opportunities is what I would usually say. And then I try to share the agenda, right, and say, like, look at this, does the agenda speak to you? I mean, one of my one of my big pet peeves throughout my career has been when an organization advertises a conference and wants you to pay a registration fee, but the agenda isn't set yet. I'm like, you're asking me to buy something and you haven't told me what you're selling. So I always try and put the agenda out there because I think the agenda really speaks for itself. And it's either gonna speak to you and you're gonna wanna be there, or you're gonna be like, oh yeah, that's not my place, right? I think in some ways you're right, but um, not to push back too hard, but ESIB is very jargony. So I think sometimes people can look at the agenda and not see, even if their work is very reflected in the ESIB space, not see the keywords associated with their work reflected in that space. So I think sometimes the agenda is clear, but if it's clear to you, you might already be here. You know? So I wonder whether like having Like the sessions, or how to describe ESIP, the meeting? Maybe, I think when I talk to biologists, which is people who maybe don't have a lot of familiarity with this set of terms, you know, I say it's just people who care about data. Um, and I think that is sometimes better than like people who care about interoperability or people who care about netcdf or schema.org like those are some amazing projects that I think a lot of people would be interested in but maybe don't necessarily have the language to get in on it. 
two more suggestions. One is like maybe starting getting them into the clusters and collaboration areas first before really asking them to say, hey, come to our conference, because that is where I get them into the door first. And then well, they know what's like to working with the groups rather than, I think it's always like relationship building, starting at early and maybe inviting the professor to be part of the classes first, and then they will become the influencer to the students who might be interested in. The other is that I think thinking about the timing of some of the meetings, not mm -hmm. it's not always the most convenient uh, time for everyone. That just because we have been doing the meeting around the same time every year, January and July, that's how we did it in the past. And in the summer, people from those underrepresented groups, they could be trying to get a job and then to support hmm. different needs. And I will note that there's a comment in chat from Kathy Todd Brown. Can we leverage the clusters as onboarding? It's free and a much easier way to dip your toes into ESIP. And that is a grand one we've noticed. Um, uh, thank you. First of all, I just want to thank and recognize the tremendous success and the the level of discussions that I've been able to have and participate. So I really want to just begin by recognizing all the tremendous things that are going on. Uh, lots of follow ups from individual conversations and also in the last session that I was just part of new ideas and new ways to really accelerate open data and open science. So in that stead, I'm mystified that students uh, are not being tapped into and it's I, I'm just thinking in in the last recent past whatever short term recent past the amount of data science data analytics programs that i'm seeing ramp up at universities is just incredible and i know many of them are looking at earth system data because a lot of them reach out to us so i think that there's just you know a concerted push and a reach to those universities uh, and happy to help support that so I think getting students in here is the beginning of a pipeline because uh, these students will be working in the workforce across public and private sector and, and happy to help. I wanted to really quickly say there are, are a lot of replies in the chat um, about connecting directly with student organizations. Um, I, I wrote the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. There's mention of the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science, um, and then the Academic Data Science Alliance. So, and I, I'm happy to introduce you to like all of their executive directors <laughs> um, because they work directly with the students. They have their own annual meetings, um, and I think receiving that. And, I can speak for me when I was when I was in graduate school, whenever I got an email from the National Society of Black Engineers, I was like, oh, what's going on? Yeah, I want to do that. Um, more so when I got an email from my professor, I was like, oh, what is this? But when I got an email from <laughs> the other group, I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. So environmental engineers too. Yeah, I was I was wondering um kind of a question and a suggestion maybe what kind of partnerships do you have with you know HBCUs and um have you considered you know geographic like scholarships to attend and registration fees like waived are great but there's also travel cost and per diems and everything so if you have your conferences and meetings in places with more geographic diversity you might be able to draw more diverse audiences because you take that burden off of the travel. These are all amazing suggestions and I will accept all resources. Um, I will say I, I would I would think Pittsburgh um, that we would have been able to attract a more diverse audience in Pittsburgh. We did not. Um, uh, but that's something we can think about in terms of our future our future meeting locations. We put a lot of layers into our meeting location selection. Our number one criteria is the entire hotel room block has to be federal per diem cost. Um, because oftentimes it's the non feds who come who have a more restrictive travel budget and i'm like it, it, it's crazy that you know we had 
two tiers of hotel room costs. And so I do, we do work really hard to keep the travel costs as low as we can, but yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great discussion um, on how to attract more diverse talent, but I also, there's been a lot of comments and suggestions that um, how do you retain them once they're here? And I think that's a really important thing to talk about as well. Um, and for me, I, I always point to authenticity. You have to walk the walk and you have to talk the talk. And that comes from top down and bottom up. It involves grassroots efforts. It also involves leadership doing that. I think there's been a lot of suggestions here too about seeing diversity in the plenaries. I would also challenge all the session organizers. Think about who you're inviting. Because again, if you don't see yourself up on the stage, you don't feel like you really truly belong. And so it's not just plenaries. I think it's more than that. It's also making sure that all the session organizers think about who is here and then who is not, and whose voice might actually bring something a different perspective than we've heard before that we could really truly be better together with. And I think that's an important thing to think about too, because even that plays into how do you recruit more through advertisement. If you see different plenary speakers, if you see yourself in the agenda, it might also just help from a grassroots perspective of getting more people to want to show up. This is potentially a very silly suggestion, but um, I think for the travel travel or for meeting waivers, even just listing it where the other awards are currently listed might make a difference too, because like that's where I would go as a student to try and find support to attend the meeting is where the awards are listed or where the scholarships are listed. I wouldn't necessarily think to like go into registration or reach out to someone. Like I think I would look at almost exactly where the community fellowships are, like that's where I would expect to see travel scholarship or travel award. Um, and I think also like it's, it's a small wording change to change from a, a waiver to an award that I think can sometimes make a difference um, for yeah. thinking about it as like, not like a, um, not charity, but something that like you're deserving of, of, of coming to the meeting as sort of someone we're excited to have there, you know. Turn it from a handout to a recognition. Right. Thank you for that. Good. All right. Let me. Um, I will do a switch here real quick. So I've asked one question, which is what do we need to keep doing? And I'm going to get to um, my, my second question and let me flip it over here in Slido. And so now the question has, has flipped. So th this is the different direction. Are there things that we need to do less of or stop doing in order to advance equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice? Hard question. Again, I, I will remind folks that we are all here in a spirit of charity. And so my, my sacred cow may wind up um, on this particular list, um, but let's let's remember to, to listen to the suggestions and the, the grace and the, the trust in which those suggestions are offered. We've heard a few of these. Uh, again, not the first time I've heard ESIP being jargony. So again, let me open up the floor. Are there things here that people want to ask questions about? Are there things here that we're voicing some things may amplify a perspective um, or where someone wants to offer a perspective? Uh, John, where did the microphone? <laughs> Uh, that's better. John Ralph, NCEI. Uh, I just wanted to say I really like the um, the comment about uh, avoid presentation to death because the the discussions and the um, brainstorming, the ideation, as uh, as Matt Biddle said, um, are really some of the best parts of the the meeting for me. So um, Denise Hills. Uh, Advanced Resources International, um, current ESIP VP, 
for less than 20 hours, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually, I had two things. We're try um, one of, I, I love the suggestion of welcoming newcomers without them being called noobs. Um, we're trying real hard. Uh, and if you have better suggestions to make it better, I please come talk to me about it. Um, and the other one is something that I'm, uh, there was a comment and I actually put a question to this comment. Um, someone said, you know, eliminating uh, voting for elected positions to only partner organizations. Um, I have a follow up question to that because currently partner organizations only have a single vote. They have one voting rep. So each partner org only has one vote. So how else would you change it? Um, you don't have to, whoever wrote that, or you don't have to answer that now, but think about that because this is something that I am very interested in exploring because I want us to be very intentional about our community, so. And if I can take the speaker's prerogative to amplify that, if you, if you link back to one of the document or read one of the documents that I linked to, one of the things that we talked about is the, the unique nature of ESIP and some of the ways that that can contribute to and the ways that it inhibits um, participation. So I happen to also be the manager of one of the ESIP partner organizations, the ORNL DAC. That means that the uh, old white guy gets to make the decisions about who gets to come. Um, and so it, it, it is those of us in positions of authority that, that have a very high degree of control about who is able to be in the room from the perspective of that economic perspective. And there, I think there's some interesting challenges that this brings up and that ESIP is an organization of organizations. How do we build on the strength that that provides us um, and maybe mitigate some of the limitations that that can place? I put that um, partially because it was hard for me to figure out how to run for being data stewardship committee chair because I wasn't quite affiliated with an organization and like, and I think I think you miss out on leadership from people who are moving and like I don't know now I'm affiliated through a part time job organization what if I want to quit my job like or what like there's a lot of these sort of ad hoc organizations that people end up participating in in some ways that it feels like in order to participate in ESIP I think having maybe even just making allowances for students in leadership positions might do something and saying like you're allowed to participate as a student if you don't have a permanent home um, as an organization but I think that mm -hmm. extends to other people as well who maybe aren't necessarily in a permanent permanent job or things like that I know it's a different model of ESIP but I feel like it'd be great to have tier five which is a person <laughs> like I'm an individual member of ESIP um, or something like that yeah Great, we're definitely going to be talking more. Who's okay. next? <laughs> and then with thanks to Sruti for pointing this out, Kathy, again, as a comment that the community at ESIP is tight, but then this means that we work well together, but can sometimes look clicky from the outside, thinking about how to run our clusters and meetings in a way that smooths this could really be powerful. Um, and then a comment that constructing election slates could really be powerful to build diverse leadership. Um, two quick comments. Um, again, I am fairly new relative to many of you, uh, but I appreciate the coziness of this conference relative to many, many others that I go and attend and participate. Um, it occurred to me as we were talking about engineers that there's a society or an association for engineers, but if you're a student getting a degree in data science, data analytics, specifically in that tract, what association do you belong to? ESIP. So that's just one idea. And second, as part of some of the breakout sessions and other conversations I was part of, for the newbies, I'm wondering, there are some really cool, innovative um, icebreakers that can be used to leverage that immediate bond, like a little bit of this weird behavior that you have to do that kind of already, you know, puts down the shell and, and build that connection. So some icebreakers would be fun uh, throughout the conference. And then we talked about like a five minute yoga in between, you know, stretch break, 
So in the sessions, if you're behaving funny, like uh, uh, everybody's doing it with you and it just changes the energy. So those are the, some things that I would appreciate. I love that you all see some of the things that we wrestle with all the time. Um, most of you and, and a lot of people are new. Um, I've been with ESA for three years um, and I have to be really careful when I walk in the door and I'm like, I can't blow up everything on day <laughs> two, right? Like, be careful so that you don't lose your job right away. Harry probably knows. It's like, I mean, we got a new mission and vision. That was kind of big. I don't know if you know how big that is. Um, but yeah, like pointing out that having individual elected positions on our board, I cannot ensure a diverse slate of officers when it is a individually elected position. I also, if people have to be affiliated with a partner organization to be on our board, I am never going to get a lawyer on our board. I'm never going to get a big fundraising person. I'm never going to get uh, an HR, you know, I'm not going to get the diversity of skill sets on our board that a typical nonprofit needs to be successful. So those are some things that folks have talked about. Um, a big thing we talked about at our board meeting this uh, this Monday, joining ESIP as a partner um, can take a really long time. If you hit the time cycle, just, I would say right, but I mean wrong, from the moment someone says, wow, ESIP looks really cool, I want, I want in, it could take you five months before we say, woohoo, you're official. And I was like, board, you got to help me out because that is not welcoming to like, I want to, I mean, I get it. We need to be thoughtful. We need to make sure that there's alignment, but the way the process works, the partnership committee meets, reviews the application. It goes to the partner assembly, to the voting reps of the partner organizations for 30 days comment period. And then it goes to our board for a vote at, and the way the policies and procedures were written, it said, at the next board meeting. Our board votes electronically on things all the time, but it said at the board meeting and they meet four times a year. So we are working to speed up the partner process so that when people find us and they say, you guys look awesome, I want in, we can say, come on in. I mean, we already right now, like if you're in partnership process, okay, we'll give you the partner rate for the next meeting because it's our fault, not yours, that our partnership process takes so long. But there are lots of things. One thing that's pretty cool about ESIP that I have, I've worked at a lot of different nonprofits, all of our governance, our bylaws, our policies and procedures, our accounting procedures, it's on GitHub. It is fully open for anyone <laughs> to read. And I have never seen an organization like that. So when you have questions, you can always call me, but when you have questions about why do you do it that way? Um, why do we have type one, type two, type three, type four, type five partners? And what does that mean? And what type am I? I'm still figuring that out myself. <laughs> um, that's all defined on our GitHub and it is publicly available in a way that I haven't seen in other places. So I just, I love that you all see it. Um, and I love that you appreciate that one step at a time, right? And, and, and there are definitely structural changes that we can and should and need to make to make this organization more inclusive and better suited to have the impact we wanna have. That was long, sorry. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that you asked that because there was something else. I was going to respond to something else up there. Uh, his question was, what is my pull request policy? And I kind of looked at him with a terrified look in my eyes <laughs> is, is what happened there. Um, so someone had said, you know, be more open to people that don't have PhDs and be more open to people who don't aren't as technical. Um, for, if anyone in this room was on the search committee that hired me, I almost didn't take this job because I am not Douglas was. I, I am not technical. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree 
in international studies with a concentration in international development in Africa. And I have a master of environmental management with a concentration in natural resource economics and policy. I had to fight my advisor because I had to take two science classes. And I thought that wetlands ecology and management was science. And he said, it has management, no. So I'm not a scientist. I came to data as a frustrated data user who saw the power and the need and said, okay, I can dedicate my career to making a difference. But when, when someone for the unconference session was like, if, if you don't, you know, who are, who are my Python users in the group? This, this session's for the people who aren't. I was like, oh, that's me. And then I was like, oh no, I don't know all those other things. I don't code. I didn't take GIS in graduate school because those people looked like they were in pain and I didn't want to do that. So I am that person. I don't, I, you can all rest very sound assured I cannot go and revise our governance because I am really not comfortable working in GitHub. But we have always had amazing governance chairs and they take care of that. So um, what happens is our, um, our policies and procedures are updated by the current governance chair. And to my knowledge, they are the only person that can make those changes. Um, so Amber will make the changes. She brings them to the board, the board votes on it. And then Amber, I believe, does the pull request to make the changes happen, but it isn't going to be me. And I love that our bylaw says it doesn't, it, it can't be me. So there you go. If you want to talk more about that, I was involved in, and it was my first experience with GitHub, by the way, because mm -hmm. I am kind of similar to, uh, I have less of a tech background than, than many here. Um, I can talk to you about how we set that up. And Mike Daniels also is really, yeah, he's like, I was hiding it back. I'm not gonna let, <laughs> um, but Mike Daniels was also kind of helped set up um, how we go about doing those updates and documenting those updates. Um, so we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but yeah, that's one of the ways that we do try to be transparent because, you know, like when we commit, we document what we did and why. So um, it's, it, as tr transparent as we can be on it. So I have quietly changed the question to now to the other side of things and, and good conversation. Um, again, and I want to riff off a little bit of, of Susan's point. I came to my first ESIP meeting in 2006. I had transitioned careers. I was an industrial chemist working for the Dow Chemical Company two months before I came to ESIP. The last time I took an earth science class, Jimmy Carter was president <laughs> and I was a freshman in high school. The, the imposter syndrome was large, but I'm lucky. I did feel welcomed and belong. And, and, and part of what many of us are after here is, is how do we extend that to to others who maybe haven't felt it or or wouldn't feel it today so the question that i have shifted to what should ESIP do more of to advance equity diversity inclusion and justice and we've got some answers here um, we've had some conversations again let me open up the floor are there things here that prompt thoughts how can we build off of what others have suggested I'll offer a perspective for folks to consider as somebody who has just recently started his seventh decade. One of the ways that I find useful to look at the world is, is how do people with less experience learn from those of us who have more? And how do those of us with more experience learn from those who are not constrained by it? Hi, this is uh, in terms of what you can do more of. Um, I don't, this is my first ESIP, so I don't know if the red, yellow, green codes were instituted just for COVID. Um, I like that. And another thing, another thing you might want to consider is I've been at, you know, cons where for autism awareness, they'll actually have the red, yellow, green uh, system for your comfort of people coming up and just saying hello. Um, and they'll actually give you like flip cards so that as your tolerance throughout the day, 
with socialization, it's like, you may start the day as a green, but like by lunch, you're a red. So <laughs> like have that, I think that might help yep. too with like, you know, it's like for like neurodivergence and neuroatypicality yep. that might help. And, and I've meant to add, and, and remember that there are some in the room who probably can't tell the difference between red and green. and then sorry it was color coded and uh shapes i love that idea as an extroverted introvert where i often feel it's too people-y so <laughs> i have to just shout out because you guys don't necessarily see who makes different decisions and decisions that get made for various things so the networking game in the past i guess years back we had a find the matching icon, right? Like find the icon that matches the icon on your badge. And that's the game. And um, our amazing communications director, Allison said, okay, I, I hear the meetings committee has said, we want, we want a badge game. And she said, but we don't want to program people to look for same. We want to challenge people to look for differences. And so while the networking game was rather complicated, it was designed intentionally for you to look for people who had a different color or a different icon than you. And that, that was why she did that. And then the, to the yellow, to the red and green, with the colors, if you noticed, she also um, wrote the color that your sticker was to be inclusive for colorblindness. So I just, I was like, she blows my mind on a regular basis and we're so lucky to have such a talented staff. So I just had to shout that out. Hi, uh, Steve Diggs, UCOP. Um, I wanted to remind everybody there's people online and they may not know us by our voice, so you have to say who you are so that they know. And now they know to turn their speakers off because I'm going to speak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fair warning. I think in a, a lot of the EDIJ settings, we forget that we ex we're existing in a time where this is heavily contested um, and silently so because it's not politically correct to come out and be against it, but there is an visible, invisible force moving the other way um, for sameness and going backwards. And I think that it would be in our best interest to treat it with the same intellectual rigor that we do every other field of endeavor, which is to say, why? tangibly why do we want to do this because it's, it's not it's even in this room i'm betting there's different reasons why people think we should advance edij but we should say why we should reference papers written on the subject for why more diversity is better and um expect people to come at us and say i don't think that you're moving in the right direction i think that esip's getting too woke and so if we don't act like that's something that can happen I don't think that the initiatives that we take on will have the, we will win people over in the way we should be. Thank you, Steve. Okay, right. so we, we're approaching the, the end of the time here. It is Thursday. It is day three for many. It is day four for some. And day I don't know how many for the ESIP staff. <laughs> um, I do want to flip back to a slide that I hadn't gotten updated in this. So um, this is, is a list of the people who have, um, as of earlier in the year, contributed to the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Justice Advisory Committee. Membership is very open. If you are interested in taking a much more active role in this, reach out to Denise, reach out to me, reach out to Susan, reach out to any of the ESIP staff members. We'll get you connected up. If you have thoughts that have occurred to you um, in the course of this or as you're going about your week, reach out. Any ESIP board member, any ESIP staff member, I'm fairly easy to find. Reach out to me, Nancy Ritchie, my co our co-chair on this um, connected up with Noah, happy to hear whatever you have. Find somebody that you are comfortable talking with um, and share your ideas. You know, if you're a flaming extrovert and want to come talk to me, great. 
If you prefer a quieter approach, there are others who are better suited. Uh, <laughs> all right. And my last piece that I want to bring up is here. So um, several folks in the equity, diversity, inclusion, justice um, have a session it's in informatics. There's a little bit of an interesting question here. Maybe hindsight is a little bit better than foresight. Um, but how do we promote equity, diversity, inclusion, justice across the earth science and data informatics communities? I do encourage folks to submit as you have ideas and, and the ways that you want to bring things to that table. Um, we're on a journey. I will try as best I can, and Nancy is very much committed to this as well, to keep the things that we are doing open, transparent, um, seeking input. Uh, we're on this together as a community. It will be interesting to see because I'm, I'm reminded from some of the work that I've done in change management. Um, in the sacred communities. And, and there's you know a pithy little comment that the seven last words of a dying church are we've never done it that way before. Um, but it's also a recognition that there is a degree of comfort um, in doing things the same way that we've done it for those of us who have been around. And again, an aspect of diversity. There, there is some excitement um, for others of us in doing things new and differently for the first time. So we will work together to find a path. I appreciate the thoughtful contributions from the folks here in the room and the folks online. And okay, thank you. Um, Kathy has also would like to invite folks to the next um, operational ethics cluster. If you want to think about how to run it better, um, she has a link. I will make sure that that link makes it into the. Um, Google Doc for this session, or somebody has already done it for me. Thank you. This is Susan, and I just want to say hi, Kathy, and we miss you. And I knew when you were a virtual attendee that we would feel your presence in the room. And I just wanted to give Kathy a shout out. And for anyone who hasn't met Kathy Todd Brown, she is one of our incredible um, leaders um, and uh, a new board member. And we are excited, mm -hmm. excited you're online, but we'd, we'd love to see you in person too. And again, thanks to our friends here for helping to make sure that the voices that are not physically in the room are represented. I appreciate that. Thank you all.